What's up guys, welcome back to the channel and to another weekly 3D model. This week, we're gonna be making an old World War II aircraft identification switch box. I came across a link that had this old World War II genuine switch box for sale that I guess you can use as some sort of display piece. But either way, I thought the textures looked really cool and I thought it'd be a lot of fun to recreate. So since this is the last video of the year, instead of just doing a time-lapse video, I thought we could do a full walkthrough and I can show you exactly what I did to create this little switch box. So without me dragging this on, let's just dive into it. So instead of just guessing the shapes along the way like I usually do, this time we are going to use a reference image that I found online. So like I mentioned, I found a link that actually went to an Etsy link that had one of these switch boxes for sale. So I just decided to use one of those images as my reference. So they had a relatively front orthographic image. Now it's not perfect, but it's going to work for this. So we're just going to save that as an image and I can drag it into my project as an image plane. That way in the front view, I can start blocking out my objects using this reference image. So I'm going to start off with a cube as that main front square shape, and then I can add a few edge loops to start blocking out where those two corners are. So if you look at the reference images, they have two corners that actually extrude outwards. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to add two edge loops and I can block out where those corners are going to be. Now I'm going to post a link in the description to the Etsy link that I use for my reference photos. That way you guys can see exactly what I'm talking about when I reference these photos in the video. So once we have those two corners blocked out, I'm going to go ahead and add a cylinder and I can start blocking out where all of those little buttons are. So I decided to start with that red keying switch. So like I said, I'm going to add a cylinder and I can start blocking out that shape. And all I really do here is just jump back and forth between the perspective and front facing view. That way I can make sure that shape is looking accurate. And once everything's looking good, I can go ahead and bevel out those edges. And once that outside metal cylinder shape is complete, we can just repeat the exact same process for the red button itself. I'm just gonna add another cylinder and I can bevel out those edges. All right, so now that we have that main button complete, before we proceed on and create all of the other buttons and switches on our switch box, we're just gonna jump back to that main box shape itself. So before I start beveling some corners on my switch box, I know we have to start positioning our buttons and switches. And it looks like from those reference photos that all of those buttons and switches are equally spaced apart. So what I'm gonna do is start adding some edge loops so I can start planning where those buttons are gonna go. I wanna make sure that they're all equally apart from one another. So I'm gonna start off with adding one edge loop horizontally where those buttons line up on the front face. And then I can add four more vertically for each button itself. That way I know they're all gonna be equally spaced apart. So now that we have those buttons and switches planned out, I can go back to those corners I was working on earlier, select those front faces and extrude them outwards. Then afterwards, I can go ahead and start beveling those edges and lining it up with the front face on my reference photo so I can make sure those bevels are accurate to its true shape. I'm also gonna make sure that I use the exact same segments on each bevel that I use on each corner. So what I ended up doing was using four segments. That way afterwards, I can clean up the topology really easily by using the multi-cut tool and just attaching each point together. All right, so now that we have those main corners all blocked out and ready to go, we can jump back to our buttons and switches. Now, if you look at our reference photo, the white, red, green, and amber buttons and switches look like they have some holes in them. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna create some low poly cylinders. I can line those up with those holes and shapes on my reference photo, and then I can combine them into one shape and then Boolean out some holes. So now that we have some booleans created, I need to go in and start cleaning up the topology. So all I'm gonna do here is use the target well tools to start merging together some of those vertices. And then I can use a multi-cut tool to start connecting those other vertices together. Now while doing this, I'm just gonna try to keep everything in quads if I can, but if I need to use some triangles, it's not gonna be the end of the world.
sing. Awesome. All right, so now that we cleaned up the shape a little bit, I can go ahead and select all of those edges and I can give them a small bevel. And then once I finish all of those bevels, I can flip the shape around and once again, using that multi-cut tool, I can connect all of those vertices in the corners. All right, so next is just finishing the main shape of the switch box. So if you look at the reference photo on the very back, there's a small cube or a little rectangle. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna select a cube. We can start blocking out that shape and bevel out those edges. All right, so now we're gonna jump back to those buttons and switches. So if you look at the reference photo, the white button is a simple cylinder with a small beveled edge. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna add a small cylinder. I can align it with my reference photo to make sure it fits inside of that Boolean we created earlier. And then I can just bevel out that edge. All right, so next up is just working on those large metal switches. Now this is pretty straightforward. So all I'm gonna do here is just start with another cylinder. I can align that with my reference photo to make sure it fits inside of that Boolean we created earlier. And then I'm gonna delete all of those front and back faces and I can start extruding that front edge. Now I'm not exactly sure how the shape works, but using that reference photo, I kind of just guessed it and I just started extruding it to make it look like the reference photo. So let's go ahead and just wrap up this one switch. And then once we have one complete, I can simply just duplicate it two more times to create the other two switches. All right, so now that we have all of those metal switches complete, we are gonna move on to that other red small button we have in the top left corner. Now I think this red thing is a light. I don't think it's an actual button, but either way, we're gonna recreate this shape. Now I went about this shape a few different ways. I originally was thinking I would create a lower poly cylinder, and then once I had that main shape locked out, I can just smooth it out to create some more divisions, and then I can add that bumpy effect on the outside. I was also thinking I can add those small bumpy rivets just as a texture or a material in Substance Painter, which we could easily do, but I thought it would just look a little bit more realistic if we can add that directly into the geometry. So as you'll see here, I just start adding a lower poly cylinder and I just started experimenting just by creating that shape like I just explained. And then once I smoothed it out, I realized I could probably have some more edges around that cylinder that way I can just extrude a little bit more and it would just look more accurate to the reference photo. So once I try that one route, I just delete the shape and I just create another cylinder with more edges. 
Now obviously it's quite a lot of polys, but I am trying to make this more photorealistic or similar to the reference photo, so I just decided adding it, like I mentioned, in the geometry would just give me a better result. So I can increase those subdivisions up to 200, and then I wanted to select every second edge so I can just scale them outwards to create that bumpy effect. Now you can go ahead and just select every second edge, but that would take you quite some time since we have so many around the cylinder. So I just decided to use a small little script, that way I can select one edge, put in this script, and once you pressed enter, it would just automatically select every second edge around the cylinder. So I will link this in the description below, and I'll also put it up on the screen here so you can see exactly what it is if you want to use it in your own projects. So now that we have that main shape complete, we can add a sphere and we can position that right in the middle to create that small rounded shape. Now we do come back to the shape to add those small extrusions, just at the time I didn't notice it, so we're just going to move on to those screws first and we'll come back to it later. So like I said, it is time to create a small little screw. So all I'm going to do here is create a sphere, I can chop that in half and I can align it with one of my screws in my reference photo. And I'm just going to scale that inwards. I want it to be a little flat. I don't want it to be too rounded. And then once I'm happy with that shape, I can go ahead and add in a small cube and I can start blocking out that small little X shape that those little Phillips screws have. Now I'm not going to worry about getting it too perfect here since these screws are so small and they are relatively rounded in those reference photos. It should be quite easy to achieve. Now, I do end up just deleting the sphere. It had way too many polys, and I thought it'd be much easier to work with if it had fewer edges. And then afterwards, I can just smooth out the shape. I always find when you're working with booleans, it's always easier working with lower subdivisions. So once I extruded those faces on my cube and I have that cross or X shape, I can simply boolean it out into my sphere. Now obviously once we create that boolean, we have to go in and clean up the topology. So using that target well tool, I can start merging some of those vertices and then using the multi cut tool, I can start attaching some of those vertices together. If you look at the reference photo, that cross shape is actually a little bit rounded in the corner, so it makes my life a little bit easier and I don't have to worry about having some really stiff, hard edges. All I'm going to do is add some supporting edges on the top and the bottom, so once I hit three on my keyboard and smooth it out, it can look like a nice little Phillips screw top that I can add on my switch box. Alright, so just before we move on to the UVing process, we just need to fix up the back of this switch box. Now it's fairly straightforward, we could have just kept it plain, but I thought it'd be cool to add those small little details, and all it really has is just some booleans. So just like we did on the front, we are going to add some cylinders, we can combine them into one shape, and then I can boolean out a few holes on the back of this object. And then like always, using that target weld and multi-cut tool, I can clean up the topology so there's no faces that have more than four sides. Like always, you're trying to aim for four, but in those corners, it's really okay to have some triangles.
So to start things off, we're going to select those image planes. I can group them together and hide them. I don't need them yet, but I don't want to delete them in case I just want to look at a few things for reference. So I can select all of the other objects in my scene. I can go ahead and delete the history and freeze transformations so it can remove any unnecessary items and remove all of that history. Now we're going to start at the very top of our outliner. We can select that and we can start working on it. Now we're just previewing the object smooth. It's not actually smoothed yet, so we want to first do that by going up to mesh and smoothing the object. Now it does sometimes add a few unnecessary edges, so all we're going to do here is just go in and select some of those edges and we can just alt delete so we can remove them. Sometimes I like to do this just to clean up the shape a little bit before we move on to the UVing. So now that everything's looking good, I can delete history, freeze transformation, center pivot. I can go up to the UV tab and do a camera based projection to remove all of the cuts on the model. Then using that 3D cut and sew UV tool, I can start adding a few cuts on those edges of my shape. And I also am gonna add one directly on the bottoms, so that way when I unfold all of these UV shells, they're gonna unfold nice and straight. So in my UV editor, I can select all of those UV shells. I can control U to unfold and control L to lay them out. Now they're not gonna be perfectly straight, so what I'm gonna do is select each UV shell and underneath the unfold tab, I can go ahead and straighten those UV shells. Once those shells are straightened, I can select them once again and control L to lay them out. So now the shape is looking complete, those UVs are looking good, now we can move on to the next shape in our outliner. So using the exact same process, going up to mesh and smooth, I can smooth out the object, clean things up, remove any unnecessary edges and anything that I just think doesn't belong there. And then using the exact same process, freeze transformations, delete history, and using that 3D cut and sew UV tool, I can start creating those cuts where I want them. Now what I start doing here is just grouping up each button and switch in their own groups. That way I can start grouping up those UVs together. So I just use the automatic layout with all of those UV shells for each different button. And then afterwards at the very end, I can start grouping them up into one large map. So I just keep redoing this exact same process for each shape in the scene. Now I'm not gonna show the full process. I feel like it's not really needed since it's the exact same process over and over again. But if you are interested, I will be uploading a video with the full process to my Patreon page, which is linked in the description below. So let's just fast forward a bit when I was done doing all of those cuts and laying them out. And I'm just grouping together all of those shells into my UV editor. Now I ended up just using one texture map for this object since it's so small and it had a lot of room to work with. And I also just moved some of these shells around at the very end before I started texturing. Now, like I mentioned earlier in the modeling process, I did miss that little extrusion into that small rounded shape in the top left corner. So really quickly before we go into the texturing, I want to create those small extrusions. So this is pretty straightforward. I'm not going to just talk through the whole process, but I will show you. All I do here is just add a few small cubes, similar to how we did the other extrusions and the booleans we created earlier. I'm just going to combine them into one shape and then boolean out those holes into that shape. Now, if you look at the reference photo, it just looks like a black hole. I'm not sure if it's just like hollow inside of that metal cylinder. So all I end up doing is just extruding that edge downwards and then I just leave it hollow since I want it to be black and you're not going to be looking in that small and close into the object itself. Now, once I'm done that shape, I do have to go back and just re-UV it since I modified it after I originally UV'd the object. So using that exact same process with that 3D cut and sew UV tool, we're just going to recreate those cuts and I can lay those UVs out and fit it into my UV map.
All right, and just like that, our modeling is complete. So all we have to do is assign a material to it, and then I can export it and we can import it into Substance Painter so we can start texturing. All right, so now in Substance Painter, we can go ahead and load in our FBX file from Maya. Once it's loaded in and everything's looking correct, we can go over to the texture set settings, scroll down to bake mesh maps, choose your output size, I chose 4K, and make sure to check on that use low poly mesh as high poly mesh since we only have one mesh to work with. All right, so to start things off, we're gonna start with the largest shape in our scene, which is the box itself. So I'm gonna go over to my Smart Materials tab and I can go choose that steel gun painted texture that comes with Substance. I thought this would be pretty fitting since it looked like a rough metal material. And all we have to do is just go in and turn down those scratches and all those grunge effects. We can add all of those our own afterwards. So to start off with some of our own dirt and grunge, I'm gonna add a fill layer. I can go over to our masks tab and I can drag on whatever masking effect I want. So I start off with this gun edge masking effect. That way I can add some more scratches and dirt effects around the edges of these objects. And then I add some more fill layers and just gradually build up some other dirt and grunge effects on top of it. Now I did wanna add some cool roughness since our reference photo looked pretty grungy. So I'm gonna add another fill layer, but I'm gonna turn off the color and the metal channels. That way I really only have my rough to work with. Then I can grab some cool texture and drag it onto my roughness slider so I can create some cool roughness onto my object. Now it was still looking a little bit too shiny and glossy for me. So I decided to right click that fill layer and add a levels to it. And then I can change the affected channel to only affect the roughness value and I can just edit it to increase that roughness on the object. All right, so now we're really quickly gonna jump back to that dirt and grunge. I'm gonna add a few extra fill layers on top of this and we can slowly build up those dirt layers. Now I don't wanna go too crazy and start just throwing a lot of stuff on top of this. It can quickly get out of hand. We're just gonna gradually build it up slowly. We can layer on those different dirt and grunge effects. All right, so next up is moving on to those metal switches. So for this, I decided to use another smart material, that bronze armor, and I just change it from that yellow color to more of a white. All right, so next up were those small screws. Now, I originally, I just started with that silver armor. I really like this material, but it just wasn't working. It was looking a little bit too clean. So what I decided to do was switch over to the iron forged material, the smart material, and I just assigned that to those small screws in my scene. All right, so next up is that small white black button. It's actually a black button, but it's under the white label. So this is pretty straightforward. Once again, I'm gonna use that rubber dry smart material and we can assign it to that object. Now, while I was doing the UVing, I made sure to do a cut around this hole. That way those shells on the inside of this button are separate. That way you'll see when I'm applying this rubber material, I also apply it to those UV shells that are inside of the button. That way I can darken it up a little bit and it looks more hollow and you can't really see those faces in the renders. So next up were those top two buttons, the one on the top left and the keying switch red button. So for both of these, the back metal pieces, I just used that bright steel layered smart material that comes with Substance Painter. I just opened up the folder and changed the color a little bit to make it more gray. And then I added another fill layer so I can add a little bit more dirt and grunge since the color looked a little bit too clean. All right, so next up was that red part of the button and the little light. I believe the left one was a light, but either way, it's pretty red or orange. So we're gonna open up our Smart Materials tab once again, and I decided to use one of those plastic Smart Materials. All I did was just change that color to make it a little bit more orange red, and then I just dragged down that roughness value so I can make it nice and shiny. And I did the exact same thing for the right red, and I did the exact same thing for that dark red king switch button. Just instead of making it as bright orange red, I decided to make this a little bit darker of a red cone and I also made the roughness value a little bit higher. I also didn't want those colors to look too clean. So once again, I'm gonna add a few fill layers and I can add dirt and grunge on top of it.
All right, so next up on the list was just doing all of the labels. So this was pretty straightforward. Once again, I just decided to use a fill layer and then I can go over to the alphas tab and I can scroll down to the fonts that come with Substance Painter. Now, I'm not exactly sure which fonts are used in this reference image that's actually used on the object. You might be able to do some Google searching and actually find that out, in which case you could just print those fonts in Photoshop and then export them as your own alphas to print onto the object. But that's just a little bit too much work. I just want this to be nice and easy. So we're just going to use the pre-built in fonts that come with Substance. Luckily, they have some that are actually pretty close to the reference photo. So we're going to go ahead and choose those and then I can start pasting on the font onto my object. Now, I just guessed the sizing of these fonts. So just by looking at the reference on my opposite screen that was next to me, I just kind of guesstimated how they were and the size they were on the object. Now, one thing I just decided to do was lower the height so they were imprinted into the metal. Now, I don't know if this was actually on the object or not, but I thought it would just make it look a little bit better and a little bit cooler. So let's go ahead and start pasting on these labels on the switch box. All right, so all of those main white labels are complete. Now next up was that fine print, those little black imprinted font or letters that was on my switch box. Now this was pretty tricky. I had to zoom in really close to those reference photos and I'm not 100% sure if I got those words all correct. So I'm sorry if they're wrong, but I just kind of guessed it. They were very small and you couldn't make them out anyways. So I just wanted to get it as accurate or close to those reference photos that we were referencing. So very similar to how we did the white font, we're just gonna create another fill layer. I can drag up the bump value though, that height channel, just so it's risen up. So there's a nice bump on that text. And then using that built-in, those fonts in the alphas tab, I can just start pasting in that font directly onto that switch box. All right, and just like that, all of our fonts and our text is complete. So next up is just flipping this object around and just applying some materials to those small little circles, those metal circles that are on the back of the object. One, 
All right, so next up was adding that large label that's on the side of the switch box. So for this, I just used one of those reference photos that's on that SC link. So I just brought that into Photoshop to straighten up the image. And then I just exported it as a PNG. And then I brought that into my substance file as a texture. And then using that projection tool, we can just project that label right onto our mesh. Now, all I did here was make sure to bring up that height channel. That way I can have a little bit of a bump on that label. So it looks like it's actually sitting on top of the object itself. And just to avoid it looking too clean, I went in with the eraser tool and made some small little indents on the outside, just so those lines aren't perfectly straight. The label looks pretty beaten up as is, and I didn't want those edges to look too perfect and unrealistic. And the colors were looking a little bit too bright. I wanted to darken it up just a tiny bit. So all I did was right click that layer and I could just add a levels to it. And then just by affecting that base color, I could just drag down those sliders depending on how dark I want those values to be. And I also did that for the roughness just so I can make it look a little bit more rough. All right, so now spinning back around to the front of our switch box, I'm just gonna add a few extra dirt and grunge effects. So inside of those bolts, they were looking a little bit too clean and I wanted those little cross sections to be a little dirtier or have a little bit of orange or yellow tone inside as if there was some rust or a little bit of dirt. So just like all the other dirt and grunge, we're gonna do that with a fill layer and I can drag on whatever masking effect I want to create that. Also, that little black rubber button was looking too clean compared to all the objects around it. So once again, adding a fill layer, we can add a little bit of dirt or crunch on top of that. I like every object in my scene to have a little bit of dirt or some sort of smudge on it. So there's an imperfection on every object. All right, so last but not least, I noticed in the reference photo, there were some words or some small little bump effect around that top left light or button. So we're just gonna add those small imprints. Now I'm not exactly sure what these are as well. It was a hard time making it out in the reference photo, but I just decided to guess what they were and add those small details. So just like the other small bump effect that we added into our labels on the front face, we're gonna do the exact same thing just on this other object. So adding a fill layer, I can increase that height value and then using the built-in fonts that come with Substance Painter, I can directly paste on that text. And once again, I don't want it looking too clean, so we're gonna add another fill layer so we can add a little bit of dirt on top of it. All right, so the textures are looking good. Now let's jump into the renderer to see how everything is looking. So all I do here is just click on clear ground. I wanna remove that background image and I just wanna see the object. And then I change that environmental map. I usually end up using all the studio lights. I just find it really makes those textures pop and look good, but use whatever lighting source you think works for your model. And then I also went down to the focal length and I increased it from 17 all the way up to 50. So at this point, it's just a matter of jumping back and forth between the editor and the renderer until you get the model into a final state. I find this is one of the longest parts of the whole texturing process is this last little bit when you're tweaking things. I really find you can spend quite some time just tweaking things until you're happy with how everything looks, but it's also probably one of the most important parts of the whole texturing process in my opinion. 
But that's basically everything. That is the whole texturing, UVing, and modeling process that I did to create this old World War II aircraft identification switch box. I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a like and don't forget to subscribe to see more weekly 3D content. Once again, this is the last video of the year and I just want to give a really big thank you to everyone who has subscribed and helped support the channel. I can't believe how much this channel has grown over the past year. We just passed 7,000 subscribers and I'm just blown away with all the support and all of the great feedback I get from all of you. And I really want to give a special shout out to all of my Patreons. You guys really help support this channel and help me continue making these videos and I'm hoping in the future we can continue to make more videos and all help each other become better artists. I have a lot of big plans for next year and I want to really grow the community and help us get closer together so we can reach out and help each other. So keep an eye out for a lot of cool ideas and things that I have planned for next year. Until then, thanks so much for tuning into this week's video. I hope everyone has a happy holidays and an awesome new year and I'll catch you guys in the next one.